Recently, PwC's Women in Work Index showed that gender pay inequality in Guernsey is among the worst internationally, with only Estonia, Korea and Japan having a higher gender pay gap out of the OECD countries. And that gap was getting wider year on year, even before COVID, which has had a disproportionate impact on women workers. In July 2020, the states approved the principle of equal pay for work of equal value, although it's not scheduled to become law until 2027. And shortly after that debate, policy and resources warned that implementing this principle for public and civil servants would cost the taxpayer an extra £50 million a year, something that led critics to conclude that women, therefore, in the public sector were currently being underpaid by the same amount. Why is it that women are in the majority of low paid, underpaid and insecure jobs? And why, when a man and a woman are doing the same job to the same level of expertise, utilising the same set of skills, do men tend to get paid more? And as for changing things, did it always come down to a moral argument versus an economic argument? These questions and more are at the heart of this edition of Table Talk. Joining me today is Carly Parrott, uh, a specialist employment lawyer with over 20 years experience who has worked in both Australia and Guernsey. Charlotte Long is an activist, commentator and community award winner with an interest in student rights. Richard Sheldon is a partner and head of the employment team at Appleby Guernsey. Richard advises clients on employment law, data protection and regulatory issues. And Susie Crowder, Director of Human Capital at Grant Thornton, who's the founder of Bright Futures and the organiser of the Human Capital Summit on the Future of Work. Welcome, everybody. Thanks Thank for you. joining us tonight. So in terms of gender pay, before we get into the more sort of local, um, specifically local areas, let's take a step back and, and really talk about how we've got in this situation in the first place. So we've already heard in the introduction about the disparity between uh, the amount paid to women and men. So I would look to Susie first of all. Um, how do you think we've, we've ended up in this situation in the first place where there is, where there is a gap? Well, I, th I think it's important to take note of history. You know, it's not that long ago that women couldn't vote. Um, they weren't really seen in manageable positions, let alone running companies or countries like we see today. So I think... Um, you know, the, 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 the historical context uh, is really important, but that clearly demonstrates progress. And indeed, uh, following some uh, recent global Grant Thornton research, we found that over 30% of women now hold senior management positions global. Um, and indeed, the 30% club celebrated the fact that now in FTSE companies, that they've, met, they've met or exceeded that 30% mark. So I think what we're witnessing is progress, um, and it will take time. Um, fewer women are having children. Um, I know that's a personal choice, but it can delay career progression in some cir circumstances. Um, the equal pay bit's really interesting. Uh, we surveyed locally organisations and found that only 23% of local organisations proactively have an equal pay for equal work policy. Um, is more legislation the right solution here? I'm not sure. Um, I think what we will experience further is a cultural shift where we see many more women in the workplace with more ambition, with uh, better skills, better qualifications, better education, um, and they will naturally rise to the top. And I think we're seeing that already. Mm -hmm. Lots to unpack there, I think, in the next half an hour as well. We'll, we'll explore some of those things in, in more depth. Um, Charlotte, from your perspective, I mean, um, Susie was saying that, uh, you know, that the arc of history is, is long and um, progress has been made to an extent in recent years. But, I mean, what's your take on, uh, on why it's taken as long as it has? Um, I think I'm definitely with you on the, I think the history side of it and, you know, women only being able to vote um, in sort of recent sort of years. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big question. Yeah, very big question. But then I think looking at it from a young person's perspective as well, looking at that history, you know, I, I don't want to grow up and I don't want my children to grow up in a workplace and I don't want my career to be sort of pressured or structured by pay. I should be able to go in the same, in the same career and doing the same job as a man and get the same pay from it. Now, I know we can't always take progress for granted, and um, it's, it's tempting sometimes to think that there's always sort of forward progression 
things do and, and, and um, often, sadly, go backwards. But is this an area where, by and large, we, we are moving in the right direction? I think it depends on what perspective you take from that. I mean, you, you asked at the start, of what are sort of, why are we, where we are? And I think there's sort of, there's two, and it's been, it's been aptly described, I think, by the PwC report, um, that there are cultural and that there are structural issues there. And the, stru and the structural impediments are the ones we're talking about, the policies, procedures, flexible working, legislation, that sort of thing. And that sort of thing can be changed. Where the bigger problem is, is the societal stuff, the, con the, the uh, cultural issue there, the, bi the biases that exist. Mm -hmm. um, those are the ones that really need to be targeted. And I think you mentioned in the introduction, Lyndon Trott's uh, comments about the 50 million. Um, and it was quite interesting actually to see the responses to the comments to that one of the Guernsey Press articles. Um, and it was, I guess, disappointing to see there was a, a local advocate and partner of a law firm over here that was making comments that um, suggested that the pay gap didn't and doesn't exist in Guernsey and that it was imaginized by women, uh, by feminists, I think was the term. Um, and it's that sort of attitude, and that is of someone that is in the legal profession at a high level. It's that sort of attitude um, that is going to be, that is limiting mm -hmm. uh, the progress from that cultural perspective and that is ingraining those biases. And it's that sort of thing that we need to be focusing on. Richard, so I think aptly described a mm -hmm. cultural uh, element and a structural element. Mm -hmm. Um, the latter you can sort of codify and make attempts to change culturally. It's, it's a bit slip, more slippery and more difficult. Yeah. Um, I guess bringing it in a little bit uh, to a Guernsey level uh, and, and looking at the example you just gave. I mean, culturally, is Guernsey, is Guernsey there yet? Uh, do you detect much pushback when this topic comes up in conversation? There is pushback. I mean, we can't kid ourselves where we are. Um, equality in Guernsey lags behind a lot of other jurisdictions, even the UK. The UK has nowhere near got it cracked, but I used to work in the UK and I, I could comfortably say on these sorts of issues, Guernsey is at least five years behind, particularly in financial services. You've got a situation now where places like the FCA are actually showing leadership in this area. You ask what our local regulators trying to do in this area, it's based nothing. And that's not that's not good enough, really, is it? And, and to, I suppose to pick up Carly's point about the attitudes, I, I think sometimes I, I, I'm luckier because I can be more blunt about it than Carly can. I can, if I see it, I've got to call it out. I, I have that responsibility and I've got to take ownership. And I think certainly male leaders have to show that leadership. And it's disappointing when there are still those attitudes because they do exist. Um, it's it, it, it's a fact, but I think the, the one the one positive note I would say is that as the new generation of leaders are sort of are coming through now, I think you'll start to see a lot of those sorts of historic attitudes. Quite frankly, the sort of prehistoric view of, of women in the workplace are gradually going. Um, people who are coming through having from their start of their career, being exposed to things like equality training, actually now when they're getting in a position to make decisions about pay and reward, actually have that in, the, uh, that's second nature to them. Whereas actually for the people, perhaps uh, as Kai's referring to, they didn't have that at the start of their career and it's, it's almost, they feel forced on sometimes. Does anybody want to have to guess as to why Guernsey is faring poorly compared to other jurisdictions in this area? You mentioned sort of, in, in one particular context, you know, we're five years behind. Yeah. Now, now, why is that? Would anybody want to suggest why that might be? What is it about Guernsey culturally which uh, has led us to this position? I mean, I, I was going to say, is it helpful to sort of, to be able to answer that is to actually understand what the gender pay gap actually is. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, Susie's probably the best place to do that. But, you know, it's not just about pay. And what a lot of the reports and reviews have said is that it's, it's about the number of uh, women that are in senior positions and the disproportionate amount of women that are in certain professions that tend to be more lowly paid. Mm -hmm. So when you're working out the medians and the, and the means uh, to get the gender pay gap, those are the two biggest influences that are going in there. So the question, I guess, in Guernsey is, um, you know, we have very limited data that's available other than what PwC and Grant Thornton have put together. Um, the, the states have uh, released some data in relation to the gender pay gap in the states. Um, and that shows that, you know, there is a very, that there's a disproportionate amount of women 
um, in the pay up to 60 grand. Around about the, se the 60 to 70 grand mark seems to be the sweet spot for equality of pay. And then beyond that is when it sort of divides up. Um, so I think you know, looking at why it exists here, I think you sort of you were very generous when you said Guernsey was about five years behind the UK. Um, you know, my understanding is we're, we're a lot further behind. And, and in terms of you know the the obstacles ahead, the uh, the resistance to to efforts to make the change. I mean, are those rooted principally? Do you think in in, econo in economic arguments, which may or may not be persuasive, uh, but but do you hear uh, the counter arguments coming? from an economic perspective, or is it more from a social or cultural perspective? And indeed, you know, to what extent have you, in, in your various walks of life, um, had pushback or detected resistance to this, or even, I think, as, as was mentioned earlier, um, through the Guernsey Press comments, or the, just a, a disbelief as to, as to the fact that this is even a problem? I suppose what I'm saying is, you know, um, both personally, have you have you detected pushback? Have you have you detected a sort of a counter narrative where people are saying, oh, "Look, it's been blown out of proportion. It's not as bad as, as it seems," um, or yes, there is a problem, but it's explicable. It's there for a reason. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think there's a basic lack of understanding about what the problem is and how it comes about. Um, and you have to, I think, with looking at Guernsey, you have to split out financial services and professional services from the rest of the economy. Obviously, financial services plays a massive role. And I think the issues in that sector are probably slightly different from the rest. So if you look at things like the hospitality sector, for example, a much higher proportion of women work in that. There's a lot of part-time roles in that. Very unsecure work. We've already mentioned about the impact of COVID on that particular sector. There are massive problems that people don't understand I think the basics of the gender pay gap is one of the challenges because very often it's not actually about men and women doing the same job but getting paid differently. That's not really where most of the problems are. Most of the problems are people who are in the work in hospitality typically get paid less. If you then translate that into, say, the state, as an example, take the nursing profession. Now, my personal view, when the legislation finally comes into play, the nursing profession are going to be absolutely ripe for a challenge. If you think about all the training, all the qualifications that the nursing profession have to go through, and then you compare what they get paid to other sectors of the civil service, they are absolutely right. Now, the interesting thing is in the UK, that, that those challenges aren't available because you've got to work in the NHS in the UK to compare. Nurses, they can pick anyone in the civil sector, and they will. And that will be one key area, I think, that you'll see those challenges come through. And I think once those challenges come through, to go back to your question, actually people start to understand what the problem is. And then you'll start to, people will, there won't be a floodgates of claims, but there'll be one or two, and that will then mean leaders say, well, hang on a minute, this could be our organisation next, well, let's do something about it. And as much as we need the carrot uh, to encourage people to do the right thing, sometimes you need the stick as well, and that's where the legislation will come in. So it's almost as if, you know, if, if we temporarily at least sort of remove men and women from it and just look at the spread of jobs and the value that society attaches to those jobs, um, and you know, you mentioned nursing um, of all stripes, you know, um, key workers uh, in care homes and so on, um, you know, manual labors, laborers and so on. Um, there, there are certain professions and certain certain jobs which are which are you could say undervalued, li literally and, and culturally. Um, and then to bring men and women back into the mix, you know, a, a, a disproportionate amount of those are filled by women. Um, Charlotte, from your from your perspective, I mean, <clears throat> do you do you sense? Um, how can I put this? So, I mean, you, you're, you're 18 years old? 17 at the moment. Okay. 18 soon, okay. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so the world of work is ahead of you. Yeah. And, you know, society, as, as we've said, attaches yeah. certain values to certain positions. Do you feel that there is um, it's a weight of expectation as to the type of job that you will go into? Absolutely. And I feel like, as, as a girl, I, I study health and social care. Um, and a lot of those sort of healthcare professions and childcare professions are so-called women's jobs and as a result of that they 
often become lower paid jobs uh, in comparison to those so-called male jobs, which are you know, like, like labouring jobs or even just office or senior roles. And I think, for me, I think it's really important that with our younger students at that sort of post-16 education that we're offering girls the opportunity to go into some of the trades or go into things that is not what we see now as the norm. You know, girls go into that and boys go into that. I think it would be really nice. And I, I know people, I know some of my friends who would love to go into, into trades and because they're very sort of hands-on people. Um, and I think part of that is opening, giving people the right opportunities and allowing people to sort of express themselves through their work as well. So do you think there is um, a latent or hidden uh, sexism within the, the career system? So sort of that there, there are gendered work roles and, and in your experience, you know, are you, are you kind of steered explicitly or implicitly towards certain things? Um, you know, you're a woman, therefore, you know, you'll, you'll, here's a caregiving role or here's something which plays to, you know, purported maternal instincts yeah. or something. I mean, absolutely. I think when I sort of transitioned into the college, it was sort of, you know, these are the courses that we offer that might interest you. And those were very much, you know, hair and beauty, health and social care, childcare, things that people typically associate with a woman's role. But actually, when I look at my future in my career, I, I would see myself being in a senior role leading a team of people mm -hmm. um, and obviously that's that's very different to I guess what is expected and what was expected um, a few years back. I think you've hit on, sorry, that's okay you go ahead. Um, I was going to say you've hit on a really important point from the education side of things you know because they're kind of like four stakeholders I guess that can input massively into the problem you know, into the issue and you know you've got the government, you've got the states, you've got organisations, employers, you've got educators mm -hmm. and you have individuals as well. Um, and the education point is actually really interesting because we've, if, if you think about it from as young as nursery and preschool you know, kids are boys play with yes. cars and trucks and girls play with Barbie dolls. And it still happens now. And, and as parents, we buy our sons cuts and, you know, and, and Paw Patrol and, you know, even Paw Patrol, there's five boys and one girl in the main crew. Um, but, you know, from, from very young age, as parents and as educators, we are unconsciously enforcing those biases. And that's where I think the start, the solution is going to come for Guernsey and for the rest of the world is in education and right from the start. It's educating our teachers, it's educating our parents, mm -hmm. it's, it's educating everyone that actually, so that, you, that, there, that there's a consciousness of agenda. Mm -hmm. So um, would yeah. you agree with raising your children or advising people to raise their children like sort of gender neutral that they can choose themselves or they can yeah, dress they themselves can, yes yeah. you know like it's so i'm not saying everything has to be gender yeah, neutral <laughs> boys are boys girls are girls you know and yeah. you know and there may be something in between but you know it's it but it's just that opportunity mm. there it's giving those options and it's not it it's not guiding yeah Make is it anybody here right. going to say that or oh, we're going to stick the neck out and say <laughs> that there are gen properly gendered jobs of course, so, uh, men, so, men and women are different. Mm -hmm. we, have dif we have different skills, you know, jobs that are much more physical yep. are always going to attract more men for doing it, you know. Um, you know and women are generally naturally more intuitive. Um, like that, you know, but it's like there are certain roles that naturally men and women are going to go towards. Mm. Any pushback to that? Charlotte, do you think there is... No, I, I do, I do agree with you. Um, I, I completely agree with you. There are those and traits that men have that women, are, women aren't as good at or vice versa. Mm. However, I do obviously feel that a woman can be just as good at a trade job as, mm. as a man can, you know? And yeah. <laughs> but does that line of thinking not lead us down a particular path? Or well, the risk is that if we associate certain gender qualities uh, with, if we say that, um, okay, men are naturally um, more adept at this and society values this above other things therefore there will be more men doing those jobs and they will get paid more for it. What I'm saying is that we are different men and women are different what shouldn't be there is an expectation of those differences um, being attributed to particular roles mm -hmm. but we shouldn't be a it shouldn't be we are all equal we're not equal we're different mm -hmm. and we want equality of opportunity yeah. and yeah. I think it's that's equ a, it's equality a of choice. Um, and things can change. That, uh, that would be the one thing I would say. If I take my profession, the legal profession, historically it probably was one of the most undiverse professions <laughs> out there. Uh, you had to be white, you had to be male, you had to be upper class, which, okay, what, 
two out of three I am. Uh, <laughs> and actually, over time, that has changed to the extent that now more women are going into the legal profession than men, by a long way. Um, there are still challenges within the legal profession. I'm not holding us out as a bastion of everything perfect, far from it. Um, but actually, at the, at the bottom, you say, well, how do you change? Actually, these are generational changes. This is not, you don't change in five, five minutes, five years, 10 years. Actually, by having more women coming into the profession now, it is a lot more diverse than it ever was. And it will continue to be, and it will continue to get better. But the point is opportunity of choice at the start. And as long as Charlotte has that choice, what you choose to do if you want to go and work in the trades, actually in Guernsey, having recent got, recently got some building quotes, I can heartily recommend <laughs> you can make a lot of money that way. Absolutely. But as long as you have that choice, it doesn't matter. Yeah. That's the key, the choice. I, I think, I think just, just one comment, sir, and, and Carly um, beautifully alluded to this, but I think it is absolutely essential in today's world that we have careers advisors who strongly influence the decision that students take at quite a young age um, that actually know more than what they, uh, they, they, they let on to know. You know, what you, what you need is, a, um, and Bright Futures have, 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 have tried to um, lobby the government to change their thinking on careers uh, provision in the schools um, uh, here. Because in my view, wearing my Bright Futures hat, I do not think it is acceptable to have an XP teacher talking to students about a career in private equity or retail or horticulture or whatever. I want to speak to somebody who has got private equity or retail or horticultural experience, not an XP teacher. And, and I think what I'm also quite frustrated about is that the change that we have not seen in you know, the two decades that I've been here um, is, is grossly disappointing. And instead of preparing young people for life after education, with, you know, how do you open a bank account? Uh, what does compound interest mean? Yeah, Pythagoras theorem is important, but compound interest is more important for me and my children. And that's what I want the education system to focus on, much more than you fit in that box because you tick this, this, and this box. Yeah. It's not about that. We're people. And opportunity should be given to all people who have different goals and aims and ambitions in life, whatever they may be, instead of being shoehorned into boxes which fit the... The, the, the measurement system that schools are, are based on today. Because it's an extremely important, significant uh, and life-changing, potentially life-changing um, interaction, isn't it? That when, when, you're, when you're exploring what you want to do post-education and when you're looking to, in, in, this, in this example, you know, careers advisors to give you good, considered, um, gender-neutral advice. I can, I can remember, Jim, at school, my careers teacher saying to me, oh, I wanted to be an employment lawyer. And my, um, my decrees teacher had said to me after I'd filled in this uh, really pointless uh, questionnaire, oh, uh, you'd, be f you'd be fabulous at being a librarian, uh, Susie. You know, you should go and pursue that. And I said, I don't want to be a librarian. I want to be an employment lawyer. People like you from areas like this don't go and do things like that. So and that was it. Game over. I didn't so do it. So, so sexist and, and deterministic as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Basically really boxing you in. Can we think of any good examples uh, locally? Um, where um, employers, and, and you can name them, um, have sort of gone out on a limb and, uh, or shown the way or, or blazed a trail and uh, sort of accelerating the change we need? Or the, are we still finding our way? I think the one observation I would make, um, and I alluded to this in, a, in our research, is that it is absolutely fabulous to see people like um, Elaine Gray uh, running the Chamber of Commerce and to see people like Wendy Dory running the Institute of Directors locally. Um, and to see Heidi Salisbury as Deputy Chief Minister. You know, those things are all really important um, uh, icons to sort of, you know, look up to and think, actually, if I really work hard and I really want that, I can get there because these women have done it. Um, and I think it, it, gives, it gives hope, it, gives, uh, it, it inspires um, ambition and aspiration that perhaps might not have been there in decades gone past, in generations gone past. So I think for the likes of Charlotte and her generation and her children's generation, we will see a lot more senior women in a lot more prominent roles doing some pretty amazing stuff. I think you touched on a really important point there in terms of, uh, I guess, leadership. Mm -hmm. And it goes beyond just those in public roles as well. And I think you touched on it as well um, in terms of we're going to move forward by leading by example. 
and that comes from the boardroom. Yeah. You know, it comes from the states as one thing, but that's probably a topic to all within itself, probably a different question. But you've got to lead by example. And women, um, women sometimes can be our own worst enemy with these things, you know, and it's something what, what needs to be embedded right from the top of every organisation is that it needs to be a strategic objective to be focusing on um, the gender pay gap on equal pay for equal work um, and equal pay for work of equal value, um, but also on promotion of you know, women within the workplace and that sort of thing. Um, and if we're not leading from the front, you're never going to get the same for any, you know, it just, it, it's, it's basic good governance. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the mindsets need to change. Those senior leaders, whether or not male or female, um, it needs to be embedded at the board mm. level. What do you think is, is stopping certain employers embracing that? And you know, because a lot of people either aren't doing it or they're waiting to be compelled to via a law change. So, uh, well, two things really: what's stopping them, and how can they be persuaded to to, to play their part? I think I mean the, the part of it coming off what Carly said is it's sometimes a difficult thing for people to accept that they do, they are discriminating against people. Actually, to be accused of mm. being discriminatory is actually quite a serious accusation now. That, I mean, these sorts of accusations you come off me to, actually people almost go on the defensive um, about it because, oh, of course I don't do it. I pay all my staff equally. You don't really, but, so how do you challenge it? I, th I think a lot of it is, is you've got to sell the upside to this. There's so much, uh, so much wasted talent is the fundamental point. If you speak to any Guernsey employer, any one, in whichever sector, they will all complain about the difficulties of recruitment, about getting good quality people. Yet you've got 50% of the population who are, to be frank, underutilised. The skills are, that are there are not being used to the fullest extent. So before we start worrying about going to get someone else from the UK, he says, being someone from the UK, um, actually, can we see if we've got people on island? And, and a lot of it is utilising those people in your organisation already and actually spotting talent and, and the fact that talent comes in different shapes and forms. It's not always in the way that perhaps you, your boss, the, your, your own role models come up. It's about understanding that. And so that's, I think, part of the, part of the dynamic. And also then you've got the other side of it, is, is the financial equation. Actually, yes, it, it, it always sounds scary. We've had the figure of 50 million quoted. Um, no, no finance director is going to want to put 50 million onto their costs. But actually, I think that's a, maybe an overstatement we don't know, because obviously we're not seeing the actual underlying analysis behind it but actually in most instances that's not what it's about not you do have some legacy issues in a lot of businesses where you've got people who have been in post for a very long time and are paid well beyond their means mm -hmm. the overwhelming proportion of whom are men but actually as those people gradually shift through the organization and then you've got the opportunity to promote actually that's going to be the key opportunities mm -hmm. that you can get the women into the leadership roles they then set the example for the next generation coming through and, and it hopefully then becomes a virtuous circle but you've got to do that sell and that's the difficult bit. I think that's where things like flexible working and COVID, yeah. one of the benefits of yeah. COVID, particularly mm -hmm. in Guernsey, is that you know it has shown us all that flexible working works. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect, mm -hmm. and there's many flexible working can come in many different forms. Um, but actually, I think the availability of flexible working for everyone, not just for women, because it, there's still, I think, a stigma attached in Guernsey um, and elsewhere to flexible working, and men are perhaps less um, inclined to request to work flexibly mm -hmm. because of the stigma attached. So we need to focus on that, and that goes back to the yeah. um, cultural biases there. But actually, making flexible working available for all is going to is going to be significant. And speaking of cultural biases, uh, and it alludes to something you were talking about earlier. Um, you know, overwhelmingly, the uh, it, whatever, it is it is the women that take time off to look after the children, have a, have a, take a career break. Um, now. Is there any reason why there should be any difference in, in the number of men that do that and the number of women that do that? Oh, it's so tough um, because, you know, when I look across my, my friends um, across the globe, okay, um, 
and the you know the child is sick the school phone hi mrs crowder i'm sorry william's sick today um it 100 percent of the time it's me to go and pick him up um and i know that that is sort of shifting a bit but i recognize that the majority of child care responsibility falls on a, a woman's shoulders and arguably quite rightly um but I, I, I've always held the view, and I hold it even today as a work, hard-working mum, um, that I don't think you can have it all, but I think there's an expectation that you should. And going to Carly's point, you know, we often beat ourselves up, the guilt of not being at home to read our stories to our children when we're you know, doing an evening seminar or, or whatever it might be, or a webinar, or whatever it is, um, or uh, you know, always being in a rush to sort of not stand at the gates and talk to the teacher or the parents, how was school today? You know, it's pick up, run, like where are we going next? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think you know, one of the things that, that's interested me over the past 18 months during the two lockdowns we've had, uh, and this is probably a very unpopular thing to say, but I speak from a personal point of view on this, is that I wonder what the, 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 the damage to our children is of us working so hard and so much because we think that's the right thing to do when we see statistics locally of children from the age of six upwards through teenagers, young, uh, young adults, who have sought mental health advice and guidance because their overall well-being has just absolutely been to the floor. Um, yes, yes, there's definitely... a whole separate conversation to be had about the sort of the, the hidden effects of COVID or you know the, the longer term effects and mm. and I guess you know what you're talking about touches upon the, the pros and cons of working from home and, and the blurring of, of division mm. between home life and work life. Th there's no but doubt Jim you know I would I would be a much better mum to William if I wasn't working a hundred percent. Charlotte I'm going to bring you in here. <laughs> do you think um, do you expect to have to make a choice um, it, assuming you want to be a, you want to be yeah. a mum, do you expect to have to make a choice to an extent between career and motherhood? No, but I think, as you said, a lot of those sort of duties will naturally fall on the mum. However, I also think it's very important that you know dads are able to take that time out of work as well, and it is sort of a fifty-fifty. And when on return to work, it's supported and it's not that massive sort of drop. Because um, I've seen quite a few sort of studies or reports that actually when um, mothers return back to work, it, they're not getting as paid as much. Mm -hmm. um, and actually when, you know, you've just had, you've just had a charge, you, you know, you need to support, support that child and getting paid less isn't, isn't going to help. <laughs> I mean, again, it takes us back to structural versus cultural. Mm -hmm. um, structurally, there are things employers can do. To, to you know to help um, uh, introduce a greater sense of, of, of equality of um, parental care structurally the there's things that states can do to introduce that you know the employers can probably do things quicker and mm -hmm. I know you know the states are very slow game um, but they need to be leading here and you know, the states are the stick I guess you know you you introduce that baseline but following on from what Jersey's done you know and you're sort of more fa you're familiar with that you know they've introduced 52 weeks per parent mm -hmm for are to be taken over three years um, and I'm not necessarily suggesting that we go that far mm -hmm. but making it equal you know there are various Nordic jurisdictions that have a similar type of thing mm -hmm. which says that if a man doesn't take it they lose it mm -hmm. you know the wife actually the mother loses the leap so it actively encourages that mutual sharing mm -hmm. of that responsibility mm -hmm. and I think you know mm -hmm. I said before there are four stakeholders one of them being the individual mm -hmm. And I think my personal experience to you is a little bit different in terms of, you know, I've got a very supportive husband who would quite happily, mm. in fact, there's fights between us as to who's going mm -hmm. to go and collect Zav when he's, you know, um, sick at school. Mm -hmm. So I think the attitudes are changing. And mm. there is, I mean, you're a father mm. as well, and you yeah, may have yeah, a view yeah, on I mean, that. Do you think, in, in so far as it's, if, if we accept that there's always going to be some compromise between career and, and um, parenthood, is that a compromise which which should apply or which should be made equally, whether you're a man or a woman? So if, there, if there's a tough choice to be made, it may be the man has to make it. It's well, I think the most important thing for me is that there is a choice to be had. At the minute and historically, there hasn't been a choice. It has been the woman who took maternity leave, who went off for however long it was, and then maybe came back to work, maybe didn't, childcare costs and all the associated problems with that. I think. You've referred to it a moment ago, Carly, about about what, what the states are doing. Actually, the states are there to, I think, 
larger employers will will do this sort of stuff. A lot of it, there's a heavy influence obviously here from the UK. The UK have shared parental leave already. So by virtue of that, some of the larger employers just do it because that's what they're going to do in the UK. Um, so that, that works. But where the states have a role to play is for the smaller employers. And look, this is tough. It's always going to be challenging on those smaller employers. And you will get the feedback that you so often hear in these areas. But one of the things that's sort of almost disappeared from the radar, when the states brought in the maternity law, a little bit right at the very end, there was a line in there that said, we'll do a policy letter on shared parental leave. I think they were supposed to report back in about 2017, or I think it was. Not a word since. Not a word since. And actually, that's not good enough. Um, these, these are things that they can at least have the courtesy of looking at. No, we're not even saying legislate, we're saying have a look at this. Consider what the impact would be on Guernsey employers. Yes, you may then consider and determine that on the facts, on the evidence, that okay, it's not right for us or, or we'll do it on a much more limited basis, but you've got to have a look. Um, and that's what's disappointing. I think Guernsey are being much further behind what Jersey's been doing. Yeah, definitely. They're, 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 Jersey is much more active at, at political level in pushing this through. There's a very active deputy over there that um, you know that is uh, um, spearheading that. And we don't we don't sort of yet have that in Guernsey. That support doesn't need, seem to be there. And that can be one of the spurs for change as well, kind of competitiveness. You know, yeah. with our with our nearest neighbour or, or further afield. You know, the fear of losing a competitive edge. Mm. So you know, if, if the moral argument in itself isn't persuasive enough. If, if the sense that you might you might lose out, that's another. Well, I, th I think the competitive also works to an extent and can help it between employers. So one of the things you touched on earlier about COVID is coming out of COVID now, almost every employer, the norm is you offer some degree of flexible working. Actually, and I can think of, and I won't name them, but I, I'm aware of two or three examples where they've sort of gone the other way coming out of COVID saying, no, well, it's not for us flexible working. This is just not. Mm. Actually... I think they put themselves in a really, really difficult position for recruitment market. I'm getting questions when I'm interviewing candidates now, younger candidates, saying, well, what, what is your position on flexible working? Mm. Actually, we can say, I can say, well, I actually go and do school runs. Mm. I work from home two days a week if I want to. That's fine. Mm. I've got an answer for that. You think about how competitive the job market is for someone like Charlotte coming through in the next few years, she turns up for an interview, she asks me the question, and, and I say, uh, mm. is she going to want to work for me? And that's, that's the challenge, actually. You've got to try and get people to want to work for you in Guernsey. It's hard yeah. enough finding them. Mm. And there is a competition for talent. And if you don't do this stuff, you will lose out. And that, that will breed a degree of best practice, certainly. <laughs> I'm going to make you the voice of a generation. <laughs> but I mean, is, does that chime with your experience? Can you see yourself and your peers when they're looking for work? Um, you know, asking asking certain questions of your potential employer, and you know, getting a sense of where they stand um, on gender equality, on opportunities. Yeah, right? definitely, hundred mm -hmm. percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we talked before about timelines and delays and so on in the context of parental leave. When the states, I think it was unanimously uh, agreed, uh, or, or put, you know, got behind the principle of equal pay for work of equal value, the sort of small print was, yeah, 2027. So why why that long? Why the delay? I think um, that the House, the Assembly that voted that through, knew that they were doing that. Um, and it was going to be an incredibly difficult task because of the vast inconsistencies in terms and conditions of employment, um, the unions, um, and the sheer logistics and mechanics of trying to execute something like that would just be vast. Um, they probably had in, insight as to the, the economic horizon being not perhaps as strong as it could or should have been. Pre-COVID, pre-Brexit, you know, the economy was in a much, much stronger position. And the States has not been, um, uh, uh, it's no exception to that, you know, the, the States uh, accounts today look much uh, more, um, uh, well, they look very unhealthy. Um, so I think that, and, and, and the previous uh, assembly that voted that through would have had an insight as to that and thought this is, this is probably the right thing to do, let's put it through, let's phase it um, into a later phase so that even if we get re-elected in the next term, we won't have to deal with this. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if they kick it down the road again for the next term to have to deal with. 
So um, a combination of economic considerations, cynicism perhaps. I mean, what's the best argument for, for delaying it? I think for me, Guernsey's not ready. If, if I'm being honest, if, I, if it, in order to, and it's equal pay of itself is not the issue. It's, it's, it's equal pay for work of equal value. Mm -hmm. That's where the real level of complexity lies. Mm -hmm. And in order to be able to say that, you've got to have a proper systematic job evaluation methodology within an organisation, really. You've got to have pay and bandings. At the minute, a lot of pay and benefits decisions within Guernsey employers is just someone walks into a room and says, I want to pay rise, and the employer will say, yeah, you're a good fella, usually. Um, OK, there's some more money, don't go. And, and because of that, the, the pay structures in Guernsey are all over the place. Yeah. So I think, certainly in the private sector, that's an issue. I think in the public sector, um, I think there's an element of actually getting the house in order because I don't think they're ready because I don't think necessarily some of the, the state members fully understand that what it's going to mean. And I think you're right there. I think it's the time to, for everyone to yeah. get their house in order. But do you think, because I was about to ask you actually, Carl, do you think though, is it going to be a case of people thinking, right, well, 2027, we'll wait and see what happens then? No, and I think, and, and, that's, and that's where the states can play a massive role here by leading by example, it's the education, it's the awareness, it's getting people understanding what the gender pay gap is, what's causing it and how to address it and start thinking about now introducing mm -hmm. pay bands and now it's not going to be appropriate for every organisation but I think there was a you know there's been a stark awakening and we've had very few sex discrimination cases in Guernsey um, and the most recent one was you know um, quite a juicy one Babes and Hitchens and you know they were able to get equal pay for equal work we're not even talking equal pay for work of equal value but was able to get into the tribunal system via the back door of indirect sex discrimination but playing exactly to this point of pay rises had been done by okay right do you want a pay rise we'll get it and suddenly you know and it was entirely at the discretion of uh the partnership and the tribunal said yeah. this is not good enough and they actually gave some really um, helpful commentary in terms of what they would expect and a lot of that would actually feed into the gender pay gap argument um, of what the tribunal would be expecting to see in a sex discrimination context but that's what we've got at the moment in terms of yeah. that protection so there's kind of a there's a slowly growing body of case law that, that there's one as well. yeah. but <laughs> right, yes, so. it was yeah. but it was public and yeah. and and it was showing and it did set some arguably some standards in terms of what mm. employers should be doing to avoid that you know it has set a bit of a precedent there mm. what comes from it we'll yeah. we'll wait and see rich and i have some fun probably i suspect but, Indeed. yeah but i think to me one of the areas we've talked about leadership i would love to see the public sector take leadership of this and say actually do you know what it will apply to us first Private sector, you look at us, we will get it right. You can learn from our examples of how we do it. And here's the, here's the knowledge, and sometimes case law, uh, coming through. That would be leadership. Unfortunately, what's happening is the private sector, it will apply to the private sector at the same time as the public sector. Now, the public sector, without question, because there are trade unions who are, I'm quite sure, itching to have a go at this sort of stuff. That's where a lot of the case law will come from. But there will, be, there will be things come through in the private sector, no doubt. Yeah. So your advice really for the states, for government watching at home, <laughs> would be to um, actually don't, don't, don't wait for the legislation, um, lead by example, Why show not? others how it's done, and then, you know, and then I guess you, you shut down one line of argument then when the time does come to... Um, yeah. to also, just not for the states, though. It's for organisations as well. It's for employers. Mm. You know, it's for now is the time to be preparing, you know, and so that hopefully... Uh, well, we'll see whether or not it gets kicked down the road in 2027. Mm. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, closing this gap is good for business. You know, it's good for people. Um, mm. There may well be a cost around it, but there's been various reports that they've done that I've uh, mm. that I read that sort of said that actually... Um, it, some reports have said that the cost to business was actually neutral because actually what tended to happen over time mm -hmm. was that the male salaries just stopped rising as much and you got mm -hmm. more females involved and actually it ended up being quite neutral from a cost perspective. Mm. Um, uh, but I don't think there's enough data out there. No, to no I know PwC made, made, made the argument that it could lead to a boost of I think it was 111 million, if, you know. But, but precisely how that pans out uh, and when you, basically where the money comes from is, is a different question. Um, 
We're nearly done. Um, I just want to touch briefly upon another potentially contentious issue, which is um, sort of positive discrimination. So potentially, particularly at board level, when you're trying to introduce a better gender balance, um, what, are, what is it? Well, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go around the table, but if anybody wants to sort of give me their hot take on whether um, perhaps to accelerate change and to get us to greater parity, there, there is an argument for. Um, if presented with a, a woman and a man uh, of equal ability, if you can, if you can reach that conclusion, to to, to appoint the woman, if there is an, uh, an underrepresentation at board level, what do we think? Oh, like, I, I like that also <laughs> because I'm start probably, as, the, I, I, as the token male I, on the panel. I wasn't going to say that, but yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Look, I I am fundamentally against positive discrimination. I I think it, it leads to bad decisions. I think it leads to tokenism. I think it can actually, and, and it, we'll use Charlotte here as an example, would you want to be given a job just because you're a woman? Actually, the, for the recipient, actually you want to get a job because you're the best person for it. I don't think there's ever a situation genuinely where there are two people who are exactly equal. There's always some differentiating factor. Positive action, different thing. Absolutely. If you are underrepresented in a particular area, yeah, guaranteed interviews, all those sorts mm -hmm. of things, you can you can actually engage with the topic. Um, I mean, it's a slightly different area, but I used to work in the UK and used to do a lot of stuff with the NHS. They had a scheme for years running, I think they may still do it, of anyone who has a disability, guaranteed an interview. Doesn't matter whether you necessarily meet the, the criteria to even get the job, but you will get an interview that, I mean, that's only one form of positive action, yeah, but I, I would, yeah, that I support discrimination. Mm -hmm. no. Because presumably then with positive action then goes some way to addressing sort of baked in inequalities within the system, but isn't as uh, tokenistic. Yeah, it's simply so. stark and it's, it's I, th I think ultimately it can, it, the problem with positive discrimination, it can lead to other issues insofar as for the recipient of the job, for the, the unsuccessful candidate, Actually, it, it can ingrain some some poor attitudes, uh, and actually can make change harder to achieve. Perversely, I think I, I um, take the view of I do not support quotas at all, um, and I think board positions, particularly today, are, uh, are are made on having the right person with the right skills and experience that can bring something relevant to the table. Um, I know there's a feeling, um, uh, particularly on the NED circuit at the moment, that if you're a woman, you're in a much stronger position than a man, which is uh, unusual um, and not right, actually. Um, um, because because th th there's a feeling that um, there's a drive towards appointing more female non-executive yes. directors. So organisations like PERC, for example, who you know try to um, enforce organisations to, to take a particular approach and getting more women on, on boards. But I think, you know, when you look to the likes of Charlotte Valeur, who's quite passionate on this subject, you know, it's not just about gender, it's not about um, your, your skin colour, it's not about your age, it's about are you the right fit for the role to bring something different to the table as you serve, it, as you serve the business through its next chapter of its life. And that's what should be at the heart of the mm -hmm. decision. Um, and perhaps that takes us back to an earlier part of our conversation, mm -hmm. talking about medical. education yeah. Yeah. and, you know, and, um, and ensuring that... Um, that, that, that girls don't um, you know, aren't self-limiting. Don't don't think that they can. They're only you know they're predisposed towards sort of a narrower set of, of jobs and so on. Thank you very much. My last question, really, for for each of you, um, is there cause to be hopeful over here in Guernsey? Looking at looking at, I know we've had we've had there's Brexit, there's COVID, but it, but in, when it comes to sort of greater gender equality and closing that gap, which remains persistently open. Um, should you be hopeful, or is, uh, should should we are we going to give in and be cynical? We never give in. <laughs> never give in. Um, you know, there is always <laughs> hope, and you will always have. And particularly now, you know, there's a bit of momentum going. And one of the you know, so there's four stakeholders. You know, the the the, the mm. fourth stakeholder is the individual, and each of us 
men, women, have responsibilities and we can each play a part in this. So, you know, if we get enough of us standing up, a bit of a call to arms, um, we can make a difference. Um, but it has to come from grassroots and it has to start with the individual. There are things we can do. I'm not talking about lean-in movement or anything like that. There's things that we can do as individuals towards this. Um, so, yeah, I, don't, I, th I think there's plenty of hope. I think if we make the sort, same sort of progress that we've experienced um, over you know, the past decades um, um, uh, that we've alluded to right at the very beginning of this conversation, I, I think we will get to where we, we are trying to get to anyway, because the world around us is changing. Some of that's imposed by legislation, some of it's imposed by, guys, this is the right thing to do. Some of it's imposed by individuals saying, you know what, I'm going to break the trend. I am going to be the first in my family to go to university or to have a board position or whatever it might be. It is just changing naturally. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if that pace of change continues, you know, we, just, we do something like this in a decade's time, I'm sure we'll be sort of saying, OK, guys, how are you going to keep up? Mm. And that's, I think for me, well, the very fact that we're even having the conversation shows that there's progress. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think 10 years ago, even, a, even the concept of, of gender pay gap didn't really even exist in games. So that actually, the very fact that we're talking about it is progress in itself. I think what what you would hope to start seeing over the next five years or so, certainly as we're getting into the run up to 2027 and and the equal pay of equal value, is actually more employers looking at it. I think that's that's where you'll start to see again the next shift as people try and tackle the issue. Because if you don't measure it, you're never going to be able to solve it. Um, I mean, gender pay gap reporting is a whole other topic. And whether you do that publicly is a separate debate. But actually, if employers are doing it internally, they're starting to look at the, the numbers, they'll actually realise, you know what? A, we have a problem, but B, hopefully we can do something about it. So, yeah, definitely, I think it is heading in the right direction. I think, yeah, I think going on from your point as well, especially as like, these conversations, as I sort of go into my career and I find out, you know, what I want to do and where I want to end up, it's these conversations that are going to sort of shape and, you know, cause that change to happen. So, um, you know, a few years' time, hopefully. We'll <laughs> it seems very <laughs> fitting that you have the final word, <laughs> Charlotte. So thank you and thank, every thank, thank you. you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in 10 years' time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. And um, as always, feel free to give us feedback. And uh, we'll put some details up at the end of the credits. You can I'll tell you how you can do that. Thank you very much. <laughs>